I often discourage people from getting sheep on their homestead. But who should get sheep? Are sheep right for anybody or should nobody get sheep? How can a homesteader plan for retirement? Should they be investing? Can they have a 401k? Should they have a 401k if they're just living off the land? Is that even possible? And do I often get confused as Burt Reynolds? Yes. Yes, I do. And we're going to answer the rest of the questions in today's episode of Ask Homesteady. This is Ask Homesteady, the weekly show where we answer the questions that you've left here on our channel about homesteading, living off the land, survival, uh, building wealth, homeschooling, whatever you asked, whatever questions, we go through them and we answer them. And if you have a question you would like answered, it's very simple. All you need to do is to leave a question on one of this week's videos. And when you leave that question, put hashtag all one word, hashtag ask homesteady with your question. That way, when I'm going through all the questions on Friday, seeing which ones we're going to answer, I can find your question. We might not answer your question. We get a ton of questions every week and we just don't have time to answer them all anymore. We try to pick the best ones. Congratulations. If you get in this week, it's one of the best questions. So let's jump right into the first question, which of course is the question everyone's been asking. Uncle Dutch Farms wants to know, dude, when are you going to shave the mustache? Just going to have to wait and see. <laughs> How does it make you feel that's one of the best questions of the week? Anyways, next question. Superfan Candice, who gets a question in here from time to time, she asks a good one. She says, I know you like your goats and they are really, and they really are great. However, I feel that you might be unfairly judging sheep. I have Katahdin slash Dorper crosses that seem really spectacular. Would you please look into sheep a bit and maybe even do an episode on them? I think your own experience has possibly skewed your opinion. Even a positive shout out would be nice. Some people say they're easier than goats because they're much better grazers. And I had to respond to Candace and explain a little bit of things, but I figured it'd be a good one to talk about on the channel because yes, just in last week's episode of Ask Home Study, I did discourage someone from bringing sheep onto their homestead. And I've done that from time to time. So let's talk about sheep. Why do I discourage sheep so much? Am I anti-sheep? What's the deal with the sheep and me? Was it a bad experience and I'm just like mad and I can't get over it and I wanna besmirch their name? So I wanna ask you a question before we get into sheep though and whether or not they're good or bad. And I wanna ask you, uh, is a hammer good or bad? How about a nail gun? Is a nail gun good or bad? Well, most of you are probably thinking the hammer is a tool. It's not good or bad, it's just a tool. What you do with it is either good or bad. A nail gun is the same thing. It's a different kind of tool used for a similar purpose, but with a different way of using it. Different people need that. It's not really good or bad, it's just depends on the job and what you're doing, who's using it, right? So if, then I asked you, are chickens good or bad? You'd say, well, chickens aren't good or bad. Chickens are, again, they're like, they're an animal that we could bring onto a homestead and they could do certain jobs. They would be good at certain jobs, like that hammer, they would be bad at certain jobs but they're not inherently good or bad. They're just something we can use on our homestead. Exactly right. How about goats? Are goats good or bad? You get the picture. I don't think sheep are good or bad. I think sheep are sheep. They are good and bad at different things. And so oftentimes when asked by viewers, should I get sheep, especially when this uh, when we do this segment of Ask Home Study and people ask me, hey, should I, what should I get? Uh, last week we were asked what someone should get after chickens. They own chickens, said what is the next animal I should get? And I said I would not get sheep next. Uh, and then I went into why I would get something like pigs or cat or, um, sorry, not cows, pigs or goats. And so Candace after that video was saying, well, you know, sheep are good. Why, why do you talk badly about sheep? So. 
instead of saying that sheep are bad and I don't like sheep and, and goats are great and they're way better than sheep, uh, let's talk about sheep themselves. What are they good at? What are they bad at? And then who do I actually think should get sheep? Because like a hammer and a nail gun, there's a purpose for both. A hammer is great for driving nails. A nail gun is much better at driving nails most of the time, but not in the hands of a newbie. If someone's never driven a nail before, they're better off starting with a handheld hammer. It's simpler concept, easier to use. You're not gonna hurt somebody with a hammer doing nails as likely as you are with a nail gun. You're more likely to hurt yourself with the hammer than you are someone else unless you're trying to and you like throw it at them. But the point is, hammers are good for beginners and also expert carpenters still keep a hammer by their side because they're an effective tool. But someone who's building a house usually is going to have a nail gun to do a lot of the driving of nails because it's quicker, it's more efficient, it's heavier, it takes more skill to learn how to use the right way, uh, but it's better for kind of large scale production, someone with more experience. And that's really the way I feel about sheep for homesteaders. I don't think sheep are a good first animal or beginner animal, especially for someone who like last week had the goal of being self-sufficient and wanted to breed their own and keep going. And I'll get into why in a minute, uh, we'll talk about the, the pros and the cons. But just as a general rule, I don't think sheep are good for beginners or people with very small homesteads. However, sheep are, like Candace said, as far as grazing goes, if you got a lot of pasture like we do here, big property, good quality pasture, sheep can be better than goats. They can solve some problems. So there are people out there who should definitely have sheep even over goats or any other livestock. So what are sheep good at? They're not good, they're not bad. They're good at things, they're bad at things. Well, like Candace says, they're good at grazing. Now, let's kind of explain grazing. What do we mean by good at grazing? Well, if you have really good, high quality pasture, good quality grass growing up, goats aren't gonna be great for that. Goats don't like to graze down at ground level. Goats are more browsers. They like to walk around and eat higher up things, weeds and uh, briars and brambles. Sheep are better at mowing. So if you have a big pasture, lots of land, lots of flat pasture, good quality pasture that you need worked with livestock or would like to work with livestock, sheep are a much better choice for you over something than like goats or chickens. So sheep are good grazers on good quality, nice flat pastures, or even, I mean, hilly pastures is okay too. What else are sheep good at? Well, one of the things I think sheep are better than goats for sure, and uh, even some of the other animals, if you would like to raise animals for meat, people really like lamb, and they will pay really good money for lamb. You raise a herd of goats or a flock of sheep, I guarantee you, lamb for kid, you will make much more money off your lambs than your kids if you live in the United States or some of the other areas that the people watching this are. Now, goat is very popular in different places, but in the United States, nine out of 10 people in everyday America, I know there are some areas with a lot of ethnicities that do like goats. So in those areas, we're not talking about those areas. Just in, you know, most of America, United States of America, the, the average person has eaten lamb, likes lamb, it's a special meal. The average person has probably not even tried goat, nor do they want to spend a lot of money on it. So sheep are better than goats when it comes to selling meat. Definitely, you're gonna make more money and you can do lambs, you could do feeder lambs, which I think if you're gonna get started with sheep, you should do feeder lambs. Don't raise your own sheep and breed them. Just do feeders, buy a bunch of feeders in the spring, raise them through the year to the fall and then you got some lamb to sell. Really nice way to make a little bit of money or fill a freezer without having to worry about the breeding and all that other complicated things. And you can build your sheep handling skills on feeders, which then go away for the winter time. So here on this very property, I mean, this is a perfect example. Back uh, at Squash Hollow, <laughs> we had sheep. 
back at our Squash Hollow farm, we did have sheep. And we did have a bad experience there because Squash Hollow was not the right property for sheep. There was not a lot of pasture, even less when we had the sheep than what we wound up putting in for our cows. It was low quality. Basically, the sheep were able to graze our little yard and by the house. And what wound up happening is we lost one sheep to worms because it just didn't get rotated around enough. And we were very new at the time. We didn't know enough about how to protect the sheep from the worms. Um, and then the other two that we didn't lose, we wound up, uh, at the time, we were actually downsizing our farm. So we just sold them back to the, actually, we brought them back to the person, Kay's aunt, who we got them from. So we just gave them back to Kay's aunt. Those, uh, that experience was a good example of we were not people who should have sheep at that time. We were beginners in homesteading. We didn't know about worming and uh, worm loads and how to manage that. Uh, we didn't know much about rotational grazing and we didn't have a good property for sheep. So at that time, the sheep were like the air gun in the hands of a newbie. It was dangerous, it was not good. Uh, we were better off with hammers, you know, goats, bang, 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 or not even goats really, we were really better off with like chickens and pigs. You know, a lot easier livestock to raise. When we move here now, we've moved here, we actually probably will own sheep in the future. Not this year, we got too much kind of ground level foundation stuff to take care of. But sheep are really good on this property. There is a herd of about 50 of them on the other side of this very fence line. Kay's aunts have. They're great for the pastures here. They're great at keeping the pastures mowed. They're great on the property. There's a good market for lamb and uh, feeder lambs. So they're, they're great for us here. We don't have them yet. We, again, in the future possibly, but they would be great for us here. Uh, so there are good things about sheep, and depending on where you live, you can take advantage of those good things. Now, what about bad? What are the bad things? Why do I usually say beginners or small property owners shouldn't have sheep? Um, I talk a lot about worm load on sheep. It is a scientific fact. It's not my opinion. Sheep are more susceptible to worms because of how they graze. If you have not a lot of pasture, uh, sheep are going to graze. They will graze. They will chew that grass right down to the very bottom of the dirt. They don't like a goat just want to eat up here and browse on the twigs and the briars. They're eating down on the ground and what's down on the ground? Poop. So compared to a goat, they're already diving into where the poop is more. And then when compared to like a cow, a cow poops on the ground. A cow is a grazer that eats grass at the ground level. But a cow will not eat around its poop. It does a big plop, and you'll see it in your pastures. If you have cows out in the pasture, there's a big mound of grass all around that big plop. Cows avoid eating by their poop. Sheep don't. They have the pellets everywhere, and the life cycle of worms, they come out of the poop that's on the ground, they crawl up the grass near that poop, and then the sheep gnaw down that, and they get back in their system. It's all over again. So for scientific reasons, sheep are harder to manage for worm load than these other animals. And that's one of the reasons I usually suggest beginners don't get sheep. Another one is their flocking nature. Now this again, it's not really good or bad. Uh, it's just a thing you have to know about sheep. I consider their flocking nature bad because I don't have herding dogs. I don't want to train dogs for herding. I train dogs for hunting. It's a different thing. Um, so if you're into handling dogs and you're into herding animals, if that's something you like the idea of, well then that's not bad at all. That's good. That's something you can enjoy doing. You actually, if you're good at that, like a skilled carpenter with a nail gun, you can take sheep out all over the place. You don't even have to have fences because you can just guide them with your dogs as long as it's not near a road or something. Uh, but you know, on big tracts of land like out west, people hire people to come in and herd sheep and manage pastures with sheep. So that's actually a good thing. But if you're a new homesteader who's not good at handling animals, uh, part of that flocking nature of sheep is that when they're frightened, they will flee. They'll just run and scatter. But sheep over the hillside here on the other side of the farm, if they get chased by like a coyote, a sheep will run into the woods and just lose itself in the woods and just be gone forever if you don't go and find it. So they need to be managed more. Now if you have really good fences and enough land to rotate within those fences, well then again, maybe sheep would be a good choice for you. 
Sheep are not bad. Candace, I don't hate sheep. I just don't think they're a good choice for a new homesteader or someone with small acreage. Uh, I know from past questions, Candace has a little, you know, good size amount of land. Not a huge farm, but she's got a nice middle size homestead to work with. So a couple sheep to move around as long as you got good pastures. Uh, that's great and anyone who's got maybe 10 acres with lots of usable pasture back at squash hollow we had 10 acres but it was it was mostly hill not grass so if you have 10 acres some good pastures and uh, you, you got some good fences uh, there's another bad of the sheep fencing when it comes to fencing sheep I do believe they're one of the harder animals to fence especially with electric uh, sheep they have if they're wool sheep they will be insulated from the shock of the electric so they will be more likely to squeeze out of not well done electric fence. Uh, you need to have really good electric fence for sheep, whereas an animal like a cow will respect an electric fence more, or even I believe a goat, as long as it's not too short and the goat's not jumping over it. So sheep are not good, sheep are not bad. They're good at certain things, they're bad at certain things. And if you think from what I've said, sheep sound good to you, if you've got some experience with some ruminants, you got a nice size amount of land with good quality flat pasture that you can do some good fencing on and kind of keep them contained. Uh, while they're hard to electric fence, sheep are probably less escape artists than goats are. So they, they have the good and the bad. So should you get sheep? Well, that's up to you. Uh, you know, there's the good, there's the bad. Should you use a hammer or a nail gun? You should use whatever you feel comfortable with and is best for the job that you have. How's that, Candace? Better? Roxanne wants to know, how do we keep guinea hens and other free range fowl alive year round? Great question, Roxanne. Uh, first off, guinea hens are kind of your, if you get it right for guinea hens, you can get it right for anybody. They're the hardest animal to keep alive as far as free range fowl goes, in my opinion. Guineas are, flighty birds they make very stupid decisions uh, as far as where they're going to go what they're going to do they're the low drop in the bucket if you can fill that hole and keep them in the bucket everybody else is going to do better so let's focus on how we keep guineas alive and all the other animals will kind of follow this if if you're going to have guineas free ranging on your property first off you're you're definitely going to deal with losses However, I think it's worth it for guineas because of why we have guineas. We have guineas on our farm here, we had them back in Connecticut, for tick control. We have seen, it's not a scientific study, it's, you know, it's definitely not really good hard data, but unfortunately, you know, we haven't been able to do a scientific test on this, so we're going to have to go with what we've observed from our experience and what we have observed, again, not scientific study, um, guineas on a property, running around, pecking in the grass and the dirt and the leaves. The minute we had guineas on the property, we saw the ticks on us every day kind of go down. And if we would step into the neighbor's yard, just right over the border, not a hard border, wherever the guineas wouldn't go, because sometimes the guineas would wander into neighbor's yards. But if I knew like my house was here and just three houses down the road. I went into my neighbor's yard, right off the road. We used to take walks on Squash Hollow. And we would walk from our house. We'd leave our, our house, leave our driveway, walk down the road on the side of the road of our house. That's The guineas would go there. They'd be in the road once in a while. It was a very quiet street. We'd walk down the road a little bit farther than the guineas where they would go. And once we got beyond that point, the ticks would start crawling on us. Again, not real hard data, but just the best data we could go we could you know make a decision on so having free range guineas will help with ticks will improve that situation they're great for tick control but when you free range guineas they will die like crazy in the beginning we have developed a few techniques that i want to share with roxanne that will help so first off if you can get guineas as eggs not keats Hatch them under a broody hen, so a broody chicken, who you know goes into the coop every night. So you get like a silky, one of those little bantam chickens who really like to sit on eggs, and they're kind of the size of a guinea. Uh, get the eggs, they're expensive guinea eggs, but it's worth it if you want to keep them alive. Get the guinea eggs, 
put them under a broody hen, let her hatch them out. For the first couple months of those Keats' life, they're going to think they're a chicken. They're going to follow Mama Hen around every night in and out with Mama Hen. They're going to go outside, forage around, come inside at night. And if they keep going with that hen, eventually they'll figure out they're not chickens. There's like that sad, you know, fox and the hound day in their life where they're like, oh no, we're different animals and we do different things. But it's not like the fox and the hound. It's more like the fox and the raccoon. Like, well, we're different, but we're both on the same team here, right? <laughs> they'll figure out they're not a chicken. They'll kind of stop following Mama Hen around. But that homing nature coming back to the coop is pretty powerful if they've been raised by a hen. And so a lot of times you'll find they come back to a coop or if they come back to a barn, they'll come back there. They may start to then roost in a tree near your barn or a tree near your coop. They really like roosting in trees and that's where it gets them in a lot of trouble. Because if they come in the coop at night and you shut them up, they're safe. And during the day, we'll talk about how we handle free ranging in the day, but there's less danger in the day. We always found our guineas were getting killed when they would roost in trees, but they were more trees on the border. So if they roost in a tree by your barn or a tree by your coop, what you need to do is then fence the barn or coop and include that tree. Don't want to spend a ton of money on expensive fencing? Do a little bit of electric, even just around the tree where they roost in, so no animal like a raccoon at night can get to that tree, climb up it, and eat your guineas. They might roost in the tree, but usually I find they'll roost in that same tree that's close to where they were homed in the beginning. If they start to roost in trees far off and wherever they want, well, that's their death sentence. They will die. And I looked at it like I'd rather spend money on guineas every year than chemical sprays to kill the ticks on my property. So if I had them and the free range ones, they can't take care of your tick problem in confinement. If they then go rogue on you and go free range and you lose them every year, that's sad, it's a bummer, but I'd rather do that every year than get Lyme disease. I've had it, it's not fun, and I'd rather do that than spray my property with chemicals that you know could give my dog cancer while he's outside rolling in the grass. So, as far as daytime keeping your guineas alive, the techniques we use for that would be having a dog that doesn't kill the guineas but keeps predators away. So my dogs are trained not to chase the guineas, not to attack the guineas. I have videos showing how to expose dogs to livestock as a puppy. My dogs do not chase the guineas, but they keep predators away during the day. They patrol the property with me a few times during the day. Also, having some electric fencing in your far out areas, your pastures, that'll keep foxes and coyotes from sneaking into the fields. So a combination of dog present, you present, some electric fencing at your perimeters, and again, teaching the guineas to home at night is the best way to keep guineas, free range ones, alive. And as far as chickens go, basically the same idea, having the dog that doesn't attack the chickens, having some electric at your perimeters, and you know, also another thing that can't hurt if you have hawk problems, having some, some area where near their coop, near their barn, where they spend most of their time with some trees. Some protection overhead is really good for them. Another thing you can do, throw some millet. Guineas really like millet. Throw some millet out, it'll keep them close to the barn. The less far, you know, the closer they stay to home, you, your dog, the safer they're going to be. So giving them treats, millet, that sort of thing close to the barn, another way to keep them alive. I hope that helps, Roxanne. I hope that keeps you from losing a whole ton of guineas and uh, you know yeah that's the, the best tips we've developed over the last few years. Nancy had a really good question about uh, just in general she wants to get goats she wants to get goats for good rich milk uh, but I liked kind of some of what Nancy shared with us uh, she's looking for good quality milk she's 71 going to be 72 this year she's moved away from her family to farm and she's living on social security she's doing fine on social security so awesome nancy she wants to make cheese like to be self-sufficient but she doesn't 
uh, thinks she'd be good at killing animals. Well, that's okay. She has 12 chickens, two ducks, and she's trying to keep herself busy. So I, I like this question because it's kind of illustrating what we talked about with Candace's question where there's not good and bad, there's just things that are good at certain tasks and are bad at others. And Nigerian dwarfs is one of those animals that I usually will steer people away from because I've, I've done them, I've had them, and personally I, I did not think they were the right fit. But not always, is, is, there's no one solution to fit all people, right? So Nancy lives alone. She's older, she doesn't want to have meat. Uh, she's by herself, she wants to make cheese, have some good quality milk. She doesn't have a ton of people to feed. She's not raising her family on this milk. Her family's raised and she moved away from them for some peace and quiet, right Nancy? <laughs> so what I like about this question is it shows how, while maybe I would say nine out of 10 people shouldn't bother with Nigerian dwarfs, I think for Nancy they're a perfect fit for what she wants to do. She's just trying to keep herself busy. She'd like to make cheese. She wants some good quality milk. She doesn't want meat. Nigerian dwarfs are smaller. They're going to be easier to handle. So if you're by yourself, Nancy, and uh, you know, you don't want to wrestle a big buck <laughs> when it's breeding time for your goats, Nigerian dwarfs are smaller. They're just easier to handle. You're not worried about the meat factor, so who cares if they're small? Milk production is less, but if it's just for you and your hobbies, making cheese, then yeah, you can definitely make some good quality goat's cheese from your Nigerian dwarfs. You can make some soap, that's fun. And Nigerian dwarf make, their, the quality of their milk, it's high in butter fat, it's really good. One of the best goat milks we ever had was from a cross, she was an Alpine Nigerian dwarf cross. Yo-Yo was her name, she was one of my favorite goats. Uh, the milk she had, we would give to people in blind taste tests where we hand them two cups, they don't know what they're getting. One of them was cow milk and one of them was goat milk and they would confuse them all the time. It was a basically a 50-50 guess. People didn't have a clue which was which so they would just get it right or wrong based off of flipping a coin. Because the goat milk was that good quality, that rich, that delicious. For you, someone who doesn't need a lot, who's not feeding a ton of people, who doesn't worry about meat, and who would probably benefit from smaller livestock over having to wrestle with something, I think Nigerian dwarfs are a perfect fit for what you're looking to do. So go for it, Nancy. Get some Nigerian dwarfs. You just got chickens and ducks. Sounds like you just, you know, you're newer to all this, so maybe take the season and prep. If you're gonna bring goats on the property, you're gonna need some hay you know, some good fencing. Nigerian dwarfs can be escape artists, so make sure you have some good fencing ready for them. You know, have water run out, and they like warm water in the winter, so having electric where they're gonna be would be good. But I think they'd be great. Please send me some goat cheese, we love it. Are there any tried and true combined animal systems to aid in self-sufficiency? John wants to know. He asks, for example, milking a goat and feeding half the milk to a few pigs slash rabbits. All right, John, I got three for you. Tried and true things that I think I've seen enough farmers and homesteaders doing these to put my thumbs up, to encourage you to do it. And uh, there are more. Remember, before we dive into this question, the word John used, self-sufficiency, means creating systems that can continue on without outside influence. It's different than self-reliance, different than you know putting a bunch of meat in a freezer. Self-sufficiency means if the grid shuts down, if the world blows up and your 10 acres is just fine, can you survive off your 10 acres with these systems? And here are some ones that I think are really good self-sufficiency, systems that work well together, good in pairs. So I got three for you. Beginner, small scale, uh, you know, even small land, kind of intermediate, a little bit more land, and then, you know, expert level, big stuff, ready? So the first one, anybody could do. You could do it in an apartment, you could do it in your basement, in a garage, your backyard, whatever. Aquaponics. Aquaponics, right out the gate, is a system that self-sufficient that supports itself 
uh, with the two pieces of that puzzle. I don't know that I would say it's great for beginners in that it's not easier than just like owning chickens, I think, so, uh, aquaponics. But if you're looking to get into a self-sufficient system and you don't have much land or space, aquaponics is good. Plus, if you're a beginner, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to kill a few fish, which if you've ever owned goldfish, you know you're going to kill a few goldfish when you own fish. I'm not saying it's like okay to just kill a bunch of fish, but it's better than, well, I don't know, I feel personally I'd rather like accidentally kill a goldfish than a baby goat. Right or wrong, I don't know, but that's just how I feel. Maybe most of you agree. Probably some of you fish nerds out there are really mad at me right now. Fish lives matter too. So aquaponics, plants, and fish. You can get started with a simple system in your basement. You need a grow light if you're inside. You can buy um, grow lights that have all that plant spectrum. They're really harsh like purple lights. I don't love them, but you don't have to work in them. You can leave them on all night and then when you come down to work, shut them off and leave your you know, fluorescents on, which are good for plants too. You put your plants right in some sort of medium and underneath you can do where the fish are underneath in the same like container. You can do where the fish are in a separate container and the water's pumped through. We have a couple of videos on aquaponics. We show a couple aquaponic systems that we actually installed one back at our old farm. I'm gonna throw this out at you. Aquaponics don't do the same thing that owning chickens do if you're really looking for livestock and like the farm dream. I found for me personally, it just didn't fill that need. So I wasn't super into it and I've kind of decided to not go back to aquaponics myself. But if you're really into like creating self-sufficient systems that work together, the plants eat the fish poop, the plants can actually feed fish. You still need to get like a fish feed generally, but you can find plants that are edible to fish too. So it can create a really nice loop, which is what we're talking about here. And it can be done anywhere. Inside, outside, small space, large space, year round. There are some really cool things about aquaponics. It's one of those things I wish I was good at. I wish I was into it. I always want to be, and then I start working in with fish and doing water testing and stuff, and I lose steam. If you're gonna do aquaponics and you've never done anything, start with hydroponics and then dive into aquaponics. Because with hydroponics, the worst you're gonna do is just kill plants. And I think we can all agree, it's better to kill plants than anything that is an animal. Can we all agree? I don't know. Maybe I just made some vegan really mad. I make them mad a lot. The next kind of intermediate, maybe not even intermediate, this is kind of very beginner too, but you will need more land and space. That almost would be a better beginner option, you just need more land. So maybe we'd put aquaponics as an intermediate, this be the more the beginner. Chickens and a garden. Chickens are really good at preparing a space for a garden. Fence them in a small area in your backyard. They'll go in, they'll scratch it, they'll eliminate all the surface crop. They'll poop in that space with their nitrogen rich poop. You let them do that in the fall, throw a cover crop over it. In the springtime you can till in the cover crop, you can throw mulch over it instead of a cover crop and then plant right into the mulch like a back to Eden style garden. Uh, then plant your plants in that garden, up come your plants, you enjoy what you enjoy, all the leftovers go back to your chickens. We're talking all the cuttings, all the bad crop, you got ruined tomatoes, well it's chicken food. Chickens love slop, they love leftover garden cuttings, all that stuff that doesn't look good to you and your family looks delicious to a chicken. It gets turned into chicken poop, which is high in nitrogen when aged, mixed with the bedding that the chickens are in, can become a really great compost a year from now. And then in the fall, let your chickens back into the garden area, they'll hammer all the pests, scratch it up, eat the grubs, poop again, throw the mulch back down, rake it out even because it was probably there from the year before, or again, do a cover crop. And all winter long, you just gotta care for the chickens. In addition to the chickens, you get eggs and you get chicken meat if you wanna eat any of the chickens. Really nice system. Almost anybody with 
you know, even a quarter acre you could easily, I mean, you could eat an eighth of an acre, you could have a couple chickens and a little garden. And I do think that one's easier than aquaponics. So I'm going to make that the beginner level one. Aquaponics, intermediate, but with the knowledge that with an aquaponic system, you don't need any land. You can have a very small, even an indoor space. The third one is kind of like what you mentioned, John. I've seen it done. I know it works. Farmers who've been at it way longer than me do it. But it's a little bit of a change from what you said. You mentioned milking a goat and feeding half the milk to pigs slash rabbits. Pigs are incredible consumers. Half of any goat, even your best goat's gonna give a gallon a day. A half gallon of milk will be drinking by one pig like that. If you have goats and pigs, it's not a bad combination, but I'm just saying you're not gonna get a lot from the work. I, I wouldn't suggest to someone to do them together on purpose for that purpose. What I would say is if you have a family milk cow, especially one that gives more milk than like our mini Jersey, if you're getting lots of milk from a bigger cow, you raise pigs on that milk, or if you like to raise feeder pigs every year, you get yourself a cow. When we bought our first pigs, actually it was our, our second batch of pigs, we got some Tamworths from a farmer who back in Connecticut had Tamworth pigs and he had Randall cattle. And he said the day we picked the pigs up from him, now you're gonna need to get a milk cow. He said, you're gonna feed these pigs and you're gonna realize real fast it'd be better if the cow was turning grass into milk that the pigs could grow off of because heavy pigs are heavy feeders and they consume a lot of feed and they cost a lot of money to get to market weight. So cows have a rumen. They are designed, or whether you believe they are designed or not, uh, they are animals that turn grass. Let's not go there today. They're animals that turn grass into all the things they need, which then they create milk, and that milk can be very rich in protein. It's good for you it's i love milk and pigs can now whereas if a pig eats the same amount of grass that turned into that milk it's not going to do much for the pig now that milk is going to do more for the pig pigs raised on milk are delicious there are farmers who like this is their business plan they have dairy cows and feeder pigs every year and it works really good together and this particular farmer he didn't have feeder pigs he did he had pigs just Tamworth said he was breeding. So that system worked well for him. Dairy cows, pigs. He fed his own pigs nothing but milk. He said they were amazing milk-fed pigs. And uh, the dairy cows, they're producing all that milk off the grass. The pigs don't do much for the cow. If anything, they would ruin the cow's pasture real quick. Uh, but they do turn all that milk into bacon. So while they don't do much for the cow, they do magic for you and your dinner table, breakfast table, any table. Bacon's magic on any table. This is a really relatable question for m probably many of you. Zeneca, her husband and she are working on their small holding, which is the more European term for homesteading. If you're from, though well, they're from New Zealand, but many European and Apparently, Kiwis too refer to it as small holding. Probably Australians too, right? Um, anyway, homesteading. They're working on their homestead. They have 11 acres in North Canterbury. Right now they're building a house, but soon adding more animals. They have chickens and a farm dog. They want to have dairy goats and some sheep. Given the property size, and what they want to raise. They also have a household of them, three young children, so a total of five. What farm implements would we suggest they begin to budget in the future? They have a minivan, a car, small residential style lawnmower. So they wanna know, and then they have a lot of hand tools. What would be the best thing to purchase for moving heavy objects around the farm? Water barrels or heavy bales of hay? Uh, would an ATV, UTV, quad, bike, is that the best for that? What about mowing the field with the mower attached to an ATV? What about ride-on lawnmowers? Do they need a tractor? 
They don't wanna spend money on something they're not gonna use on an everyday basis. So what's the best thing for that kind of homestead? I got good news, Zeneca. Your homestead in New Zealand sounds so similar to Squash Hollow Farm. I've lived this for seven years. I know what is right for that. As long as, and I'm gonna throw this caveat out there, it's not 11 acres of flat, open grass pasture. If it's, if it's mostly open grass pasture, that's a lot of mowing for like a ride on lawn mower. So you might, if it's a lot of pasture and you don't have the livestock up to that size yet, it might not fit. But if it's not that much pasture, if you can let some go fallow back to forest or field and then just focus on what you need for your livestock, here we go, let's dive in. And I got two options for you. I didn't, you didn't give me a budget to work with. Remember, if you're leaving questions here on Ask Home Study, try to be as specific as you can. The more specific you are, the better I can help you and all those who are watching because specificity helps. So I'm gonna give you a budget. If you have a thousand, two thousand dollar budget, you're probably best off with a riding lawnmower with a cart attached because a riding lawnmower will take care of your mowing. You're gonna need to do some mowing. Even if you have sheep and goats, you're still gonna need to do some mowing. So having a riding lawnmower and then a cart will help you get a lot of things around your farm. Now you asked about water tanks and large bales of hay. So before we even talk about your riding lawnmower, let's back it up because you're fortunately right now building your home on this homestead that means you're in the very foundation level you can do a lot of things now so you don't need a tractor or you don't need anything really do some real important stuff now and you will not need much than that so let's first focus on your infrastructure instead of buying an expensive mower or a utv or whatever you could rent a mini excavator a trencher, whatever you're familiar with using, or hire a contractor for the, a couple days to come in, put in a water line. Where are you gonna have pastures? Run a water line there. I don't know exactly what your weather's like, but I do know no, that New Zealand has lots of sunshine. It's a great place for agriculture. If it's flat enough, good soil, and it never gets too cold, you could probably get away with a two-foot trench with a trencher, long and straight, cut your property in half with a long water line with T's going out. It would be a week long project at most. And then you would never need to haul water around. And that would work better than hauling water around on a tractor or a UTV. Instead of having to fill a big water tank and drive it out and then open it up, you'd have water on call anywhere on the property. That is so much better than hauling water. So. First, focus on your infrastructure. Put the money into infrastructure, some water lines. Um, as far as hay goes, you can get by with hay bales with sheep and goats. You don't need big round bales. If you buy round bales because they're cheaper, again, infrastructure, get a couple round bale holders in the right spot, buy them from a farmer who will come and deliver them on the bed of a truck, and then put a road in where he can drive down the, prop, down the property, unload a bale there, unload a bale there. Maybe he'll charge you a little extra for delivery, but it'll be cheaper than a tractor. And you won't have to do the work of picking that stuff up. You can just get it delivered and dropped in the right place. So try to plan first so you don't need a tractor. So you don't need to drive around with water barrels. Put the infrastructure in first. But you didn't ask me that question. You asked me about what should you save for because come on, you wanna get a UTV and drive around your new homestead in a UTV. That's like so much fun. So yeah, riding lawnmower in a car if you have a very small budget, that'll take care of a lot of stuff. It'll mow your grass, your cart you can load up with if you got a lot of, you know, bedding from your animals or whatever. I don't know if you're planning on putting a barn up. Most of the time I'd assume you need a barn, but again, New Zealand has really nice weather. You can leave animals outside and probably year round. So instead of barn, maybe you just have a couple lean-tos. Uh, so you clean out your lean-tos, you throw in some bedding. If you got some hay bales, you stack it on your cart and you drive it around and you're okay. If you have five to $10,000 to put aside, if you're putting aside now for it, yeah. You'd best bet, not a quad, not an ATV, go for a UTV. 
We have here, you see a, actually two Gator, well, a Gator, John Deere Gator, and then a, uh, I don't remember the brand of the other one uh, that we use from time to time. But the John Deere Gator, it's a side two door, two people sit next to each other, dump, in, dump bed in the back. That thing does so much work. We use it not every day, but we use it a lot. Every week for sure, doing garbage runs, uh, getting deliveries, bringing stuff out to the pasture. The nice thing is you can use that if you have 11 acres and your sheep are down at the 11th acre far away from you and all you got to do is zip over there, check the water lines and maybe bring their, a bag of feed for them, a tractor's overkill for that. It's going to be huge, it's going to be slow, it's going to be a lot of maintenance and stuff. You don't need a tractor. Just jump in your UTV. You can zip out to see your animals. Oh man, I forgot a, a hammer. I need a or a nail gun. <laughs> you hop in your UTV and you zip back home. That's the best bet. The side by side UTV cab dump body, and you find them used for five grand here. I don't know in New Zealand uh, what you're going to spend there, but comparable to US dollar, five grand to ten grand will get you something used going to be incredibly helpful you'll use it all the time now as far as mowing goes with one of those i've not used them for mowing mowing with a utv is going to be super annoying because they do not have a, a sharp turning radius so when it's time you go down one strip then you're going to like go wide and wide if it's a toe behind or something you could do it. I've never used them. I'm sure they make them and I'm sure they're okay. But I'd probably get a bit of a cheaper, you know, if you can find a used UTV side by side and then spend another 1500 bucks on just a riding mower with a tight radius. Uh, you'll be better off mowing with a mower and doing everything else with the UTV. But if you can only get one, Ask somebody who has a UTV with a, a mowing deck. I don't have any experience. All I know is they don't have a really tight turning radius. So instead of mowing it, turn, 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 you're gonna have to mow it in like big squares and continuously come in. And then at the end, you're gonna be doing this, kind of like mowing with a tractor, how you mow a big field, but you're mowing much less space. So I don't know. Still though, if you can only get one, that's probably the one to go with if you have enough money to do the UTV, if not the riding mower. And no, I don't think you need a tractor for this property. Unless you had 11 acres of big pasture and you wanted to do big crops, a tractor is probably overkill. We would have loved a tractor at Squash Hollow Farm for you know winter maintenance, dealing with heavy deliveries. We had a pallet of feed coming in and it would have been nice, but would have been nice is not something you pay fifty thousand dollars for, sixty thousand dollars for. Tractors are expensive. A used one would be twenty grand or fifteen, and would have been nice. It's still not something you're going to want to use every day. You don't want to jump in and out of a tractor every day. You know, if you just got to go check on your animals and bring them, you know, a bag of feed, you don't want to have to fire up a tractor for that. So I don't think you need a tractor. I think you need a good UTV with maybe a couple attachments to take care of the other stuff you need and it's a lot of fun to have just to ride around your property in. I don't know if you do any hunting out there, you know, if you shoot a kangaroo, you can throw it in the back. <laughs> Somebody just unsubscribed because I said shoot a kangaroo. Let's go to the next question. Oh, and you're not in Australia, you're in New Zealand. So you probably hate when people make kangaroo comments. You also probably hate it when people confuse Australia and New Zealand. Sorry. Anyways, I try. Walking out of the podcast video studio there. Oh, I'm realizing how long that was. And I think what I'm going to do is cut this one into two parts and make it an A and a B and release it on Friday and Saturday. So, if you just enjoyed part A, stay tuned for part B tomorrow. Maybe getting these a little bit shorter by breaking them into two videos will help everybody. Or maybe nobody, we'll see.